Hello everyone. My name is Vincenzo Ciancaglini from the forward-looking threat research team in Micro, and today I'm going to talk to you about edge computing, the fragile art of implementing it properly, and how can we exploit it to walk through access control system. So let's jump right to the chase. Edge computing is a new uh, computing architecture that compared to, let's say, the classical case of uh, IoT and cloud, where you have a swarm of IoT devices, you know, dumb devices, sensors that all communicates through a cloud service or a remote server. Edge computing brings the computational power back to the device on the edge of the network, so back to your premises. Whereas um, uh, you'd have so sensors that are now capable of processing data on the same device or servers nearby the device on the premise of the network itself. And of course, the fact of having actuation processing and acquisition all at this in the same place brings multiple advantages. Uh, you have uh, to rely less on network communications to remote uh, servers because the processing happens on site. So you have an increased resiliency, less need for network bandwidth. You have a lower latency because uh, ex exchange of messages happens uh, between nearby nodes. And in general, for uh, those applications where sensitive data needs to be handled, there's the added advantage that you don't need to ship that sensitive data off to a remote location, for example. Uh, that's the reason why it has been used on multiple verticals with success, verticals such as agriculture and transportation systems, or smart farming, so where you are in a remote field, uh, for example, and you need to do real-time data collections and monitoring of uh, machinery. Uh, for factory automations and industrial control system where response time is of essence. Think of smart uh, manufacturing cameras that needs to identify and discard defective pieces on the production line. For cameras and surveillance, where you have sensitive information, in fact, such as, uh, you know, people's faces, and elevators and building automation. So one thing that um, people need to neglect a little is the fact that you have, with edge computing, three new architectural assumptions. In particular, uh, you have an implicit trust on your device. Compared to a, call it dumb IoT device, uh, edge devices have to be trusted because they are the one in charge of acquiring, processing, and taking decisions on what to do uh, with their task. There's a higher need for data synchronization and data consistency because, again, you don't have anymore a centralized location that does the processing, but the processing is done by individual nodes that needs to be up to date with one another with the um, latest information. And the actuation, as we said, it's done on premises by the device itself without uh, necessarily supervision. So with this in mind, we asked ourselves the questions, what happens if these assumptions are in fact neglected? What happens if the manufacturer ships edge devices where um, these assumptions are not taken too much into consideration? What, that, what happens if the customer is not aware? And so we decided to investigate the problem by looking at a class of edge devices such as access control cameras. Uh, bear in mind the kind of exploits and attacks that we found are not, uh, we decided not to expose uh, uh, flaws that are specific to access control cameras as much as flaws that are specific to the fact that these are edge based cameras. And in particular, we choose the access control cameras because, well, first of all, they are easy to acquire compared to a smart factory production line or um, an agricultural machinery. But despite being easier to acquire, they embody one of the most critical. Uh, function in a company infrastructure, which is user authentication. These are the cameras that literally keep people outside of your office, you know, unauthorized people outside of your office. And despite all of that, they also implement some functions that are very affine to other fields, such as, uh, again, image acquisition and processing, actuation, and so on. So with this in mind, of all the four cameras, we took uh, cameras from four different manufacturers who are anything but a niche market. The ZK Teco, uh, ZK Teco, it's a big Chinese vendor uh, that grows more than 3.58 million US dollars on fingerprint alone in 2015, for example. This is a camera that uh, it's Android based and uh, it, doesn't need, it need, doesn't need a remote server if just for coordination and uh, monitoring, but it's fully autonomous in everything that it's user authentication and management. Kick Vision, uh, European might be aware because it's a brand that's fairly big in Europe and in the EMEA area, and it's actually one of the biggest manufacturers in the world. 
Uh, this camera in particular, the model we chose, it runs, uh, doesn't run Android, it runs a custom, uh, customized Linux distribution. Telpo TPS980, this is another Android-based camera from Telpo, which is the manufacturer that's, that partnered with Alibaba to provide Alibaba with the facial recognition technologies on all the point of services. So it's not a small vendor. And finally, MegV Koala, where MegV, it's one of the big three into the facial recognition algorithm and the supplier of, for example, the Hangzhou City Brain project, or Hangzhou is a smart city in China. Uh, the, la, those last two cameras can, in fact, run both uh, autonomously or with a cloud service, with an optional cloud service. So we looked at these cameras. We analyzed them from a point of view of the physical security, of the software security to see the patches are where up to date, um, on the communication security, which is the most critical aspect. And we identified some attacks that we decided to group uh, around those three architectural assumptions exactly to point out what happens if you neglect uh, those three aspects? And in particular, let's look at the first one, implicit device trust. So we said these devices are supposed to act in full autonomy. So you as the customer, when you install them, especially an access control camera, you trust it to identify the right people, to make the facial recognition right, to deal with the user management without the need of an external service. And it goes the same, for example, for a smart manufacturing camera, where you trust the camera to identify and discard effective pieces without necessary supervision. Which begs the, begs the question, what happens if the device is owned? Or what happens if somebody impersonates the device? And here are some nice cases. So this is an example for the um, ZK Teco. Uh, we tried uh, to see what, what, what the communication was like when creating a new user or we're doing user management in general. And the first thing we noticed is that the ZK Teco, for example, has the HTTPS disabled by default, which means that any malicious actor sitting on the same network, you know, in case you have a disgruntled employee or mm, you have a customer that sits on the guest network that you haven't secured or isolated from the others, uh, by just running a TCP down for a Wireshark can actually see the traffic over here. Now, what's interesting about this traffic, this is a request uh, that the camera performs to the remote server when it creates a new user. Whereas the server on the other side merely acknowledges the new user and propagates the information to the other cameras. What you see here in the third line is that we have it, not only the communication is unencrypted, but we have a session token that is actually reusable. All of this means that if I'm sitting on the network and I uh, capture this traffic, I am now able to forge a new request, create a new user with whatever picture I decide to send, and authenticate whomever I want to enter the premises. Not only that, but uh, with the same principle, reusing the same token, I can actually perform a call and give additional privileges to an existing user, or maybe one that I just created, so that it can act as an administrator on the whole infrastructure. Talking about device synchronization. So it's sort of is in topic, even we're talking about network uh, communication, but as you noticed, uh, edge devices need to be kept into strict synchronization. In the case there, when you create a new user, the user information needs to propagate to the other cameras in the building so that they can authenticate it the same way. And you know that doesn't just go for cameras, but in general, edge devices need uh, synchronization, which means that you need an additional set of APIs from an external server to for the device to sort of communicate with one another. And that again begs the question, what happens if these API endpoints are not authenticated or what happens if the connection is not encrypted? You see where I'm going there. So for example, for the user picture, the ZK Teco together with some other models actually, um, we managed to find an API endpoint where one could fetch user pictures. And again, the API endpoint, it's neither authenticated nor chat, nor it's rate limited, which means that anybody really knowing that URL or grabbing the URL from the network traffic, which is unencrypted as we showed, is just able to enumerate all of the user pictures in your company through a simple brute force. But let's say that you're really lazy and you just, you don't even want to do that. Turns out that heat vision, for example, uh, synchronizes periodically all the devices by sending them through device polling the full database updated database of users comprised on user data, user pictures, and so on. Well then, that means basically, since this communication is not encrypted either, that all you need to do really is sitting on the same network as the device and wait until the full database gets to you uh, ready to be exfiltrated. 
Another interesting thing we found for the telco device, the telco device can connect to a cloud service for administrative purposes. To connect to that, you need, of course, uh, an admin password, which is not known by anyone. And that would be secure enough. However, it seems that there is an authenticated API call that you can call to retrieve an access token to the interface. What is the information that that API call requires? It only requires the serial number of one of the devices that sits in your infrastructure. Where do you find that serial number? On the back of any device, really. So if the device has been badly deployed or if you can physically access the device and just look on the back, you get your serial number, you can perform your API call, and uh, you get administrative access. You can, of course, you know, with the same principle, do server impersonation. Uh, so with a simple R poisoning, you can pass yourself on the server and then all the cameras will basically send you their logs, their user pictures, their updated uh, user database. And of course, this also means that you can impeach or delay auditing because you know, there is no chance to do anomaly detection if you don't receive the logs from the cameras. Finally, for the third aspect, as I mentioned, you have an unsupervised actuator in the device proximity. In the case of a smart manufacturing camera, the camera discards the pieces. In the case of access control, the cameras open and close the door. So in the simplest case, you can wonder what happens if I can physically access the camera and just grab the wires and short, and short the wires? Well, you can open the door in that case. But it's more interesting uh, for the cases, there's something more interesting in the case of the Megvi Koala. The Megvi Koala has this three-tiered architecture where uh, you basically have the camera that acquires the picture, you have an edge server that sits on your network that performs the authentication, and if it authenticates the picture, it sends a command to uh, a network relay who's responsible for opening the door. Now, why attacking the camera if all you can do is craft a netcat command to the network relay who is not authenticated nor encrypted as well, and just physically open the door without even looking at the camera? So, some concluding remarks. Uh, this is a table that resumes more or less all the vulnerabilities that we found and all the aspects of the cameras. You see that all the cameras have exposed USB ports, which means that you can also do application side loads, and this is something that an edge device should be protected. Um, you can perform many the middle attacks in most cases, where um, where in the case of Vision, for example, it's a little harder because it's using a binary protocol that needs to be reversed, but however, it's not encrypted. And yes, most of the time, user forgery and user administration can be faked via simple requests. So it's a kind of a dire situation that seems to depend from the fact that every time we change a media and we move to a new technology, what were the best practices that we acquired on the old one, such as use your HTTPS authentication pretty much seems to disappear. So we've seen this example, you know, we moved from web to mobile web and all of a sudden HTTPS disappeared to mobile apps, to HTTP REST APIs, uh, to IoT that suffered the same problem and now with Edge. Seems that every time we change the media, all the best practices that get acquired don't seem to apply anymore. There's also another aspect, which is that Edge sort of steals a false sense of security due to the fact that you have devices that resemble dumb IoT. Those are just simple cameras, but in fact, they are not. They actually pack computational power and additional tasks inside. So users need to be aware, both the users that acquire these devices and the vendors that sell them, that this is by no means just a fancy new IoT device, but it's actually something more with uh, more dangers lying behind and more precautions to be taken. And finally, in terms of mitigations, so again, around these three aspects of the device. For the device trust, of course, we need secure network connections that needs to be implemented either by the vendor and enabled by the user. Uh, even better, network isolations for those devices, uh, you know, hardening, 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 make sure that they are patched up, again, from both vendors and customers, and constant auditing. Device synchronization, well, that goes without saying, almost the feels. Um, we need API authentication, so that needs to be implemented. We need things like certificate pinning to make sure that uh, malicious actors cannot impersonate the device and additional network isolation, of course. And for the actuators, you know, there needs to be careful deployment, cables needs to be properly installed, and extra auditing, of course. 
So this concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, sorry, we probably go better with live demos, but alas, times are what they are. And if you want to read the full paper, that is the link. Thanks.